So in this video I'm going to show you everything you need to know in order to start soloing green chests in the Rose of Avalon. I'm going to show you a set you can use to get started, I'm going to show you a full clear of a green chest on a fresh character with zero specs, and I'm also going to show you all the different bosses you're going to encounter as you do this and how to defeat all of them. So this is the gear we're going to be using for this. It's a full 4.1 set, it is very cheap. The entire set will set you back about 50,000 silver, so this is something that you can do even if you're very new to the game. For the weapon, we're going to be using a Duradic stuff. For the Q, we will be on Foreign Growth. This is a ground-targeted AoE ability that deals damage over time, and it also puts stacks on the enemies that makes your normal attack deal extra damage as you hit them. And for the W, we're going to be on Bramble Seed most of the time. This is another damaging ability that knocks enemies into the air as it lands, and this can be used to interrupt a few of the abilities that enemies will be using at these green chests. And for some of the harder bosses, we will be switching to Revitalize. This is a very strong single target heal over time ability. It has a pretty long channel time and it costs a lot of energy, but it also gives your energy back as you are channeling. So if you manage to cast this for the full duration, you will actually get more energy back than you spent using it. Um, the E is just a very strong single target heal. It has no cast time and it has a pretty short cooldown, so you can use this very easily. For the passive, I like to go with energetic. Um, it just lets you sustain energy forever. You had no energy problems at all if you run with this. Uh, I know some people like to run other passives. You have Adrenaline, which increases healing, and you have Calmness, which increases damage resistance. Uh, I think these are pretty hard to use properly, so I prefer to just stay on Energetic and be safe. For the offhand, we're going to be using a Torch. This is a very cheap offhand, and it has a cooldown modifier, which is just overall good. It lets us use our abilities more often, which means more DPS and more healing. And it also has an attack speed bonus, which is surprisingly good for nature staffs, since the Q we're using, the foreign growth, you need to hit the enemies to consume those stacks and deal bonus damage, so the more attack speed you have, the more damage you're dealing. And for the helmet, we will be using a Mage Cal on Fire Breath. This got reworked recently, this used to be a single target, now it is an AoE ability that hits a cone in front of you, and it is, for our purposes, a lot stronger like this, as we will often be fighting more than one enemy at a time. And for the passive, we will go for the damage, of course. For the chest piece, we're gonna be using a mercenary jacket on Bloodlust. This is a very strong self-healing ability. It lets you heal as you deal damage for a few hits, and in total it will heal you for about 7 or 800. Uh, the downside to this is that it can be purged, and there are a few enemies on the chest that will purge you, so you need to be a bit careful when you use this, but overall it's just a very strong recovery tool. And for the passive, again, we go with the damage. And for the boots, you can use any plate boots you want, I just prefer to use the soldier boots. Uh, we'll be using Rejuvenating Sprint, which is another recovery ability. It doesn't heal that much, but the cooldown is also pretty short, so this is just another nice tool to help you recover a bit during the fights. And while you're traveling between chests, you can choose to go to Wanderlust. This is why I like the soldier boots. You have the utility for Wanderlust, it lets you escape people a bit easier if you happen to get caught. It is a very long sprint that builds up to be very quick. So unless people have a purge for you, it's pretty likely that you're going to be able to escape if you have Wanderlust. And it's also really good if you happen to come across any cores that you would like to bring back to the HQ, for example. You can just switch to Wanderlust and transfer those cores a lot easier. And for the passive, we'll be on defense. This doesn't do much, but we don't have much choice. For the food, we're going to be using Pork Omelette. This, again, it has, it has cooldown reduction and it has cast speed. The cast speed doesn't do much for us at all, but the cooldown rate, just like the torch, it lets us use our abilities more often, which means more DPS and more sustain. For potions, these are very much optional, but when first learning, I like using healing potions, as they just let you sustain even more. You can see a pattern here, I think, but healing is good, and these are very, very cheap. A full stack of 10 is 2,800, as you can see here. So you can just pop these whenever you feel like you have taken too much damage and recover up a bit. Uh, another option is to run poison potions to speed up the DPS, or you could run an invisibility potion to make it a bit safer in case you happen to get caught. You might be able to escape gankers that way. Your set itself isn't worth very much, but after clearing a few chests you might have a lot of loot on you, and dying then might be a bit annoying. For the cape we're just gonna use a normal cape, nothing fancy, we want to be cheap. The bag, again, just a normal bag. And for the mount, we're just going to be using a tier 3 horse. Again, just because it is very cheap, and we don't need anything fancy for this. So, first of all, how do you find a green chest? Well, the first thing you need to do is to enter the roads of Avalon. 
If you're doing this from our Ava HQ, this is really easy. You just leave the HQ, go through any portal that we have that's connecting to us, and just keep going until you find any chest you can clear. Um, the other option is to do what I'm doing here and to enter a portal from the open world. You can do this from any zone in the game. All blue zones, all yellow zones, all red zones and all black zones will have Ava portals in them. I prefer to do this from blue and yellow zones because it is always safe to run to the portal and it's always safe to run back to the city with your loot once you're out. And it also makes journey back really cheap. So a thing to keep in mind, in this zone I'm in right now, it is quite far from any city. It's at least three or four zones away from any city, and this means that this zone is going to be less trafficked than the zones that are closer to the city. Which generally means that there will be less people that are using these portals. So for us, this is a good thing, because it means it's more likely that we will find chests that have not been cleared, and it's less likely to run into gankers. So, you can even see this, that most portals here are just full charges. So, all you do, you just run up to the portal, click on it, click OK on the warning if this is your first time. And now you are in the roads of Avalon, and this is considered black zone, uh, so dying here means you will drop everything you are carrying. So it's very important to keep your mount close and be wary of gankers. And this is actually a really good zone. We have three solo green chests. This is what you are looking for. Uh, we also have the big green chest zone in the middle. This is this has four green chests in it, but this is harder to clear than the normal chests. This is more recommended for groups of two or three people. It is possible to solo once you have more experience and a bit more IP, but for now I recommend to just stick to the normal solo chests. And once you're in a zone with chests, all that's left to do is to run off and scout them and see if they're up. So here we are coming up to a tier 6 green chest. Just to make a point, I'm going to be using flat 4 gear instead of the 4.1 gear. This is to make sure that my IP will always be lower than what you will have, no matter what specs you have. Uh, make sure your food buff is up, pop your omelette if you haven't already, and uh, then you can start killing this first guy. So this first enemy doesn't actually have any damaging abilities on its own, but it will keep summoning more mobs the longer you fight it. So your goal here is just to kill it as fast as you can. Uh, when you get some more specs you will be able to kill him before he spawns anything at all, but for now just kill him and then clean up whatever he spawned. And he will move around quite a bit, so it's a good idea to move your mount if you have to chase him. You never want to leave your mount circle on this mount in case someone else shows up. And next up we have probably the hardest pull of the chest, this is the double lancers. If you have done the blue chest in Ava before, you know these guys. They work the exact same way, they have their stab that also purges your buffs, and they have their jump. Uh, these guys will always start off by stabbing four times, and then they will jump you, and then they will repeat that cycle with some melee attacks in between. So the goal here is to try to kill one of them as fast as you can, as the fight does become quite a bit easier as soon as one of them is dead. Um, and use your E as needed, use your mercenary jacket if you have to. And as you're going to see here, it is very important that you keep dodging the stabs while your mercenary jacket is up. I did not do that here, and my mercenary jacket got purged, so I did not get very much health back from it. But you have plenty of other tools to regenerate, you don't really need the mercenary jacket, it's just a nice way to keep you safe. Um, popping the sprint can make it very easy to dodge the um, jump as well, if you don't feel comfortable just moving around. And it also recovers a bit of health, so you should use all the tools you have available. But you just keep DPSing, use your mage call, use your abilities, and as soon as one of them is dead, the fight does become quite a bit easier. So Now it is, it is the same thing, but you just have less things to dodge and you have more time to DPS. And you just finish up the last guy. And uh, a little thing you can do if you need to recover between pulls is you can mount up and change your W to the revitalize and use that on yourself. If you mount up and change your abilities they don't go on cooldown so you lose very little time doing this. And here you need to wait for the monk to patrol back before you pull this next run. You want to pull this guy with your W as it stuns him which will interrupt his casting. This guy also likes to move around a lot so be a bit careful with him. You want to pull him back so you don't have to chase him into the camp. That is the reason we go back to the stairs. But in general he doesn't really do anything scary, he just has some damaging AoEs that you need to dodge. And next up is the monk, and for this guy you need to wait for him to patrol back so you don't pull the next group as well. This little corner right here is really nice. Um, the monk has knockbacks and you want to be close to a wall. And this corner especially makes it super safe because he will not knock you out of it. 
So these monks do have two abilities. They have the cartwheel that you see there and have a big swipe in front of them. Both of them knock you back. But if you stand right under him, he will not use either of those abilities and he will only use his normal melee attack, which makes this probably the easiest enemy of all of them. All you really do is just stand under him and do your normal DPS rotation and he just dies eventually. And here I'm gonna do the same thing again with W healing between the pulls, just to save some time. And next up we have the Acolyte with a Heavy Drone. The Heavy Drone has two abilities that you need to be careful of. It has a big slam that it does right in front of him. If you do get hit by it, it stuns you for a very long time and deals quite a bit of damage. So you really need to either interrupt it, as I did here, or move out of it. And the next one is the Wind Wall. This is also... The ability itself isn't that scary, but the scary thing is it can very easily knock you away from your mount, which leaves you vulnerable in case gankers show up. But he, he dies pretty quick, you just finish him off, and next up we have the Acolyte. Uh, the ability he did right there, it's a circle that follows you, you cannot dodge it. It doesn't deal any damage, but it will purge any buffs you have on you. Uh, so in this case it will purge your mercenary jacket if it's up. So if you want to use a mercenary jacket against the Acolyte, you need to make sure that um, that it purge is on cooldown. He doesn't use it very often, but if he has used it recently, then it's safe to pop your mercenary jacket and heal up. He also has these balls that are floating around. They are very important to avoid. I got hit by one here right at the end, and it reduces the damage you deal by 35%, and you're healing by 15% for each stack. So every time you get hit, you get a stack of this, and it stacks four times. And if it stacks too high, you should just run away and reset, because the fight will be very hard. And next up we have another Acolyte, but this time with a Mining Drone. And this drone has a ground-targeted AoE, as you see here. It's, it puts a pool on the ground that slows you and deals damage over time. And it also has this ability where it shoots his arm forward and it knocks you back. I got hit by it here and got dismounted, so... What I recommend doing here is not doing what I do and standing and fighting, but you should reset this and get your mount back. Because if someone would have showed up here, I would have been dead. There is no way to escape. And... Uh, yeah, it dies pretty fast, and after that it's just another Acolyte, this is the exact same one as before. Just make sure you avoid the balls floating around, and make sure to time your mercenary jacket when the perch is on cooldown. And next up we have the boss of the chest. Since this is a yellow chest, the boss will be one of the normal humanoids that you have fought before. It's either an acolyte, a monk, or a lancer. And in this case it's an acolyte. It has the exact same abilities as a normal acolyte would, it just has a bit more health and a bit more damage. But you deal with them in the exact same way, which means that the boss of a yellow chest is usually easier than most of the fights you did before it. So for the Acolyte, yeah, it's still the same as before. You just dodge the floating balls, make sure to not waste your mercenary jacket by getting it purged instantly. And yeah, if you've gotten this far, you've already done this twice, so... This isn't very much of a challenge. You just finish this up and you collect your loot. And now the only thing left to do is to loot the chest. And somehow this chest b bugged visually. It doesn't look like it's open, but it is. Uh, I've never seen this before, so it's pretty funny to get this on clip. But yeah, as you can see, th this chest is open and empty, although it shows as being locked. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's a green chest on a fresh character with 700 IP. So next up I'm going to show you the other bosses that you're going to encounter as you do green chests. There are two orange bosses and one red boss. And for these clips, I'm going to be on my main instead of this fresh character, and I will be in a very different build. But this build is not at all optimized for this. It's just gear that I want to level up. The, the nature staff itself, it's so good that you can use almost any nature staff with almost any gear that you want, and still be able to solo any green chest that you happen to come across as you're roaming. So for the first orange boss, we have the Avalonian Warrior. This guy uses two maces, and in my opinion, this is the hardest boss that you can face. 
He has a lot of unavoidable damage, and he also has a debuff that reduces your healing. That's the ability is all right there. It does quite a bit of damage, and it also reduces any healing you receive by 55% for a few seconds. So be careful not to blow all your cooldowns while this debuff is up, as you will really need a recovery from your full healing potential. Try to weave Revitalize in between his melee swings to get at least two ticks off. The easiest way to do this is to start casting right as you take damage, and that way you maximize the amount of time before the next hit. And use your E as much as you can. In this clip I'm using a one-hand nature, which has a lot less healing than the druidic stuff you're using. I also don't have a mercenary jacket, and I don't have healing potions, so your build is going to be able to sustain this a lot easier. And you just keep DPSing and healing as much as you can, and when he does his big roar, you have an opening to run out and do a full duration revitalize. It's pretty much the only breathing room you're going to get in this fight, as he just likes to be up in your face and hit you constantly otherwise. And the next orange boss you're going to run into is the Avalonian Mage. Uh, this boss is luckily a lot easier than the other one we did, and it has a lot of damage that is avoidable this time. Uh, it has a big laser, you just run off to the side to avoid the damage. While you're off to the side, you can use Revitalize to heal yourself, you have a big opening where you can do a full channel very easily. And the important thing to note is just to always run back to the middle between the laser casts, because you need to make sure that you have space to run on either side without losing your amount. But other than that, you just keep DPSing and keep dodging the laser, and this is a very easy fight. And last up, but definitely not least, we have the red boss, the Avalonian Knight. And this guy, even though it is the biggest and by far the tankiest boss you can face, it is also probably the easiest. Um, he has two abilities. He will spawn swords either on himself or on you. And these swords are very dangerous as long as you don't stand right in the middle of them. Uh, if you stand on the hilts, you take no damage at all. As you can see here, you can just stand in here and heal up. When he does the swords on himself, he doesn't even hit you at the same time, so you can just... you have a full window to pop a revitalize as needed. And this is the fight. You just stand under him, and you hit him, do as much damage as you can, heal yourself as necessary, and when he does his self-cast swords as he does here, you have a very big opening to just cast revitalize on yourself and sustain and get back to full. Uh, it might take a while to kill him, but it's definitely not hard. And this guy is also worth a ton of fame, so this is a really nice boss to get. And to finish this off, I just have a few small tips on traveling in the roads. Uh, you might have noticed as you're running on the roads themselves that there are these glowing little arrows in the middle of the road. Uh, if you run on top of those arrows with your mount, you will actually get a speed boost. And this is a really nice way to just travel around a bit quicker. It makes it faster to go on the road than to go through the wilderness. And it also means that the quickest path might not always be the shortest path if you're traveling in Eva. It's often faster to take a longer route if it lets you stay on the road more. And the second tip is for journey back. Uh, this is something that you might need to do sometimes if a portal closes behind you and there's no way to get back. And journey back is very expensive to use inside Eva. But if you happen to find a connection to a blue or yellow zone, you can just leave through that portal and use Journey Back out there instead, and it will be significantly cheaper. As you can see here, my Journey Back inside Ava is about 29,000, and as I zone out to a blue zone, the price lowers to about 1,000 instead. And that is it! Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and it gave you everything you needed to know in order to start doing this yourself. It is a very good fame farm, and once your set is maxed out, you will also be making really good fame credits that you can use to spec up anything you want. And as I mentioned before, you don't have to use the Druidic staff and you don't have to use this exact set. Uh, the Blight staff is also very good, the One Hand Nature and Wild staff are also decent at this. So you can spec up a lot of the Nature staffs doing this, and you can change out your armor to pretty much anything you want to level, and get specs in that that way. And it's a very easy way to spec up things alone when you don't have people online to play with right now. Or if you just want to relax and chill out a bit on your own, this is a good way to do it. And it also makes pretty good money. Considering your set is essentially free, clearing a single chest will easily pay for a full set, in the worst case scenario. If you happen to get lucky, a single chest can pay for like 10, 15, even 20 sets. So sustaining this is, is very easy, and 
when you get into it, you can just keep going as long as you want to. So best of luck with your grinding, and I'll see you next time.